I just want to kick things off with a quick question. And, and the question simply is this, how many of you like detours? Uh, if you're like me, uh, I'm not a fan. Uh, detours are uh, most of the time unplanned. Two, they, they tend to be far less efficient than your initial you know, route that was scheduled. Three, they also bring with them uncertainty. And with that, um, that uncertainty can yield, you know, can show itself in, in a number of different ways, either via distraction or via anxiety. Does it sound familiar? I think we've all been going through a life detour here over these last six months. And what I'd like to do is help you better understand uh, the supplier uh, sector and, and how we've navigated uh, through this global pandemic here. And so with that, um, I'd like to just uh, share a little bit of context. You, hear, you see here with this title slide, if you could advance the slide, please, uh, Kelly, thank you. Um, oh, I'm sorry, go back. The, the point here is, is that before we talk about the pandemic, um, there were already some storm clouds on the horizon. And you see here that there are some, some storm clouds brewing because before the, the, the pandemic took place, uh, effectively there were a number of competitive threats that were emerging as a broad range of, of new, in, new competitors, emerging players, were allocating tremendous amount of resources in the electrification space and, and with a, a, a new focus on autonomous vehicles. And so they were able to raise capital in, in unique ways. And so that, that led to some challenges on behalf of suppliers and, and automakers themselves, not knowing where to allocate capital. Uh, suppliers facing the additional challenge of not knowing which organization was going to thrive or fall by the wayside. And so this represented a, a unique challenge. If you'd advance to the next slide, please. If we think about where things uh, are within the the, the global economy, it's, it's pretty remarkable because here over the past uh, year, we benefited from a 3% growth in, in, in the overall economy globally. Nor closer to home in North America is closer to 2% across the US, Canada, and Mexico. But, but what's pretty remarkable is now we're looking at a 4% decline. And again, in North America, we're looking at a range between six and 9% and decline. And so that has huge implications. So if we think about what that means relative to light vehicle demand, you see here that uh, we're looking at a massive correction. So effectively, there are a number of different scenarios initially you know, put forth, but effectively we're looking at a, a 20, almost a 20 million unit decline from year ago levels in terms of global light vehicle demand. It has big implications for all stakeholders. Uh, it's true for suppliers, for automakers, for, for uh, workers, employees. For dealers. And uh, so it's not just a one-time phenomenon, a one-year phenomenon. It's going to be multiple years. And so we're looking at over a, a three-year window, uh, the prospect, prospect of about a 30 million unit impact uh, to, to what was previously planned. And so this has huge implications. Um, so if we think about um, what that means then a little closer to home, again, North America, we're looking at 5 million units alone in terms of impacted or lost uh, vehicle sales. And so some pretty significant implications. If we think about the economy, uh, typically within the economy, the U.S. economy, um, a part of GDP, consumer spending represents about 70% of the economy. And so what's pretty remarkable here is uh, that, that represents a, a tremendous constraint because consumers spend from their, they're willing to spend so long as they feel comfortable about their financial outlook. And so when we think about unemployment, uh, obviously the unemployment rate here is, is shot up and with, with over 30 million claims for unemployment um, in, in the pandemic, a tremendous amount of uncertainty, even for those that have been able to restart their, their jobs, there's tremendous anxiety. Uh, and typically those who have anxiety are interested in delaying or postponing purchases. And so some pretty Im big implications here as well. If we think as well about the S&P 500, it's also a pretty strong bellwether for investor confidence. And here's where there's a, a, a tremendous chasm or you know, quite a, a unique contrast. Um, it's actually near historic highs. And so what does this reflect? It reflects effectively a, uh, a, a profound a profound degree of confidence as a result of 
measures taken by the federal government, uh, by the, the Federal Reserve, uh, as well as uh, additional um, programs via Payroll Protection Act and, and others. And so these packages have helped uh, as well as uh, expanded unemployment benefits. So we think about that, that's uh, helped to, to, to restore and, and shore up um, performance in the overall market itself. But consumer sentiment lags uh, rather significantly, over 20% down from a year ago. And so uh, obviously has big implications. Consumers then you know, tend to delay those big ticket purchases. Uh, and, and so there's some, some big implications. We think about the automotive sector. It doesn't move along in kind of gradual uh, amounts. It, it doesn't you know, go in, in, in really uh, minor, minor or very gradual movements. It actually moves in fits and starts. There's this inherent boom bust cycle that exists within the automotive sector. When things are good, they're very good. But when they're, when they're down, they, they can also uh, asset heavy, uh, long lead industry, um, the CapEx heavy, it, it represents some significant challenges in the face of, of uh, a collapse in demand. And so that's where, effectively where we're at. You know, from the peak you know, in, in, in 2016 uh, at 17.8 million units of, of production here in North America, we're looking at uh, upwards of a, over 5 million units of, of, of the decline in terms of this, this bust cycle here. And so that has, again, uh, significant challenges. Um, then if we think about then we, we also then um, look at, we, we, we survey our members at, at our association, and we're fortunate to have about 500 member firms. We, we ask them, what is your outlook and, and your 12 month outlook and how has it changed over the last quarter? Well, in the downturn, it's pretty obviously very concerning. And um, you know, the, effectively our, our members came back and said in, you, in tremendous with, with one voice saying, we're, we're very concerned. And it actually reached the, the OESA supplier barometer index actually reached the lowest level in the, the history of the series, uh, the history of the data series at 15. And that was 35 points below a neutral level. So obviously very, very concerned about a whole host of factors. Uh, what's happening with uh, the prospect for um, uh, vaccines, the, the prospect for uh, a, a cash crunch, uh, if you will, um, realistically, uh, suppliers actually get paid about 45 to 60 days after they ship product. And so in the, um, the pandemic, in the face of shutdowns, uh, you know, mandatory uh, shelter in place orders, factories were, were idled, um, asset heavy. Uh, and, and so they represented some significant challenges. Uh, and so what that means then is um, it's also, it also comes back to how uh, you know, suppliers have had to manage uh, incredible challenges, and yet they've been able to do so, bringing workers back with new protocols, with safety protocols, keeping workers um, safe, uh, and then also working um, perhaps less efficiently than they were in, in order to, to be able to, to, to bring their operations back online. But it also meant that this cash crunch, where they would have to then uh, purchase materials and pay their employees, without receiving payment for another 45 to 60 days. And so this represented a, a tremendous pain point uh, in the recovery. That said, there's also supplier, uh, the risk of, of supplier distress. And that is uh, in supply chain, uh, any supplier can be producing uh, well enough in their facility, but they, they rely on vendors to provide additional components that then go into their products and are then shipped on to consumers. And so the challenge here is that any one supplier has the potential to bring down the entire supply chain and, and the, 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 end, the end customer. And so herein lies a, 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 quite a, a concern that we had at the beginning. And, and so fortunately, while there is still concern or, or risk of uh, supplier distress, ultimately the payroll protection program uh, and, um, and the fact that suppliers were in a much stronger position here when the, uh, uh, when the pandemic, pandemic began, uh, certainly helped to, uh, to bolster the outlook and the prospects for the supply base as a whole. That said, if you'd advance to the next slide, you know, it really does underscore though some of the challenges that exist. Um, there's a, a restructuring firm, Alex Partners, well regarded. Uh, they, they've got a, a global study that they do and they talk about um, every year what, what the implications are. And they say that billions of dollars will be lost, you know, certainly by automakers, but by all stakeholders for those that 
have invested uh, in, in these technologies while consumer buy-in remains low. And so when we think about this, um, where we're at right now, obviously there's the potential then for, um, for demand to be delayed to some degree. Obviously we've talked about the, the demand destruction here early on. And so there's some big implications. If we think about 200 additional, e or more than 200 uh, battery electric vehicle models, uh, there's a tremendous surge in, in R&D and CapEx, 10X between uh, the 2018-2023 timeframe, so from the prior period. Um, so what's pretty remarkable here is it requires new solutions. So if we think about suppliers, they're looking at partnering with one another. They're looking at uh, how, they, how can they mitigate some of the costs associated with developing new technologies to, in, in order to uh, reach and, and, and be more effective and, and distribute uh, costs, but then also um, target new opportunities as well. So a lot of different reasons or a lot of different benefits, uh, speed to market, um, mutual learning by working with partners, but then also scaling up and looking at uh, obviously not only regional, but the global demand as well. So if we think about uh, one other component or one other aspect of, of how the industry continues to change, it's this shift away from hardware towards software. And if we think about historically, about 100 million lines of code in each vehicle. More recently, that's actually jumped to about two to 300 million lines of code and it's, it's reported, you know, that it's estimated that, you know, in order for a, a level four, level five uh, auto autonomous vehicle, we're looking at over a billion lines of code. And so this requires a massive reset in terms of the kind of, of technology or the kind of talent that's required uh, within uh, organizations, within supply base, within the supply base, as well as within uh, automakers. So what's, what's pretty interesting here is it's going to create effectively a, a talent war. And so if we think about then, um, what, one other aspect of, of the, the challenge that we're facing, we've asked our members, well, what are some of the biggest opportunities that you have despite the challenges? And what, what's remarkable is many came back and said, the best opportunities we have are for new business because there's going to be challenges that some other players aren't going to be as competitive. There's going to be a decrease in competition. So we're actually going to be in a strong position. Moreover, they've said there are new areas where we can invest in technology now and be prepared to benefit you're going forward in as, as the, the market improves. Finally, looking at M&A opportunities also represent a pretty substantial um, opportunity here going forward. Um, so with that, if you'd advance the last slide. You know, it's interesting here, and, and uh, just to share with you, Akio Toyota was, was speaking to his executive team here, and this is actually when times were quite good. He said, look, a crucial battle has begun, not one about winning or losing, but one about surviving or dying. What he wanted to convey was a profound sense of urgency. And certainly right now, obviously it, it is, we're, we're in this environment. And, and yet what's, what's pretty remarkable is he saw and he sensed a sense of complacency. Um, if you'd advance, please. The next point he wanted to share was, this is an era in which the correct answers are unknown. And what he was saying is that, listen, in front of his entire executive team, he said, I don't know the answers. But what he also said was, I have every confidence in you in this team, this dynamic team that has the ability to ask the right questions, to pursue the right course of action, to position our organization to move forward. And so this is a profound opportunity that each of you have as leaders right now to challenge your teams, to take advantage of the affordable technologies that continue to offer opportunities to collaborate remotely, to allow networks of distributed teams to work and to move ahead effectively. Uh, advance, please. So finally, the last point, cost reduction is crucial. It's a fight to restore our original strength. And this is, again, a, a point where we can do more with less. And so in this environment right now, I'd encourage you certainly to, to take a, a look at how you can reposition, to take some calculated risks, but also to continue innovating in, in, in this time in order to be better positioned uh, uh, in the recovery. With that, I, I thank you for your time and uh, look forward to uh, wish you well. Thank you.